Hey guys, welcome to the Rant Slot. My name is Rant, and these are the bonus episodes of the Booster Pack podcast. On these more casual episodes, we abandon our usual format from the regular Booster Pack episodes and talk about a CCG related topic, whatever I feel like. So today I've actually been able to get a really special guest who is going to give us some great info on the earliest days of collectible card games and their career. Now, their time actually affects almost all of the early collectible card games not any particular one. So I'm super excited about this episode. But before we get there and introduce them, allow me to give you a little prologue about what we're going to be talking about. So if we rewind all the way back to the early 1990s, collectible card games and the internet are both in their infancy. As far as the internet's concerned, it's basically just news groups, message boards, and email lists. And websites as we know them at the moment didn't really exist. So in these dark ages, we had people having to look elsewhere for their news and market information. And to do that, they fortunately had magazines. Yes, that's right. Most hobby games had a dedicated magazine to them and collectible card games had a few. These publications would have things like reviews of current sets, news about upcoming sets, and perhaps most valuable to any collectible card game, a price guide that would individually list all the cards and their current market value. Now, these were invaluable to players and retailers of yesteryear because they would help them organize their collections and make more informed trades and sales. But beyond just the price guide stuff, these magazines also became a center point for collectible card game playing communities. And they would feature articles based on strategy from possibly even the game's designers, or if not them, their game's best players. And aspiring or new players could look to these articles to learn new tips and tricks and new card combinations that they might not have otherwise discovered. So it is possible to say that our guest today was responsible for the entire wave of collectible card game magazines. And I can tell you that they probably would not exist without her, or at least these ones wouldn't, because our guest today was a pioneer in collectible card game journalism by creating the very first CCG magazine, Scry. Yes, that's right. I am delighted to welcome to the podcast a woman who, in the earliest years of the hobby, helped shape the way players looked at their collections and their cards. Today, we have the founder, the first editor and publisher, and a very talented writer and jewelry maker, Joanne White. Joanne, how are you? Oh, well, how are you? Nice to be here with you, Rand. Thank you for inviting me. That's okay. It was absolutely delightful to be able to get you on the show and hear some of these early stories. Um, So your history with collectible games goes all the way back to almost the beginning. But I do want to spend just a couple of moments just to get to know how you found yourself in the games magazine world, because I don't believe Scribe is the first magazine you uh, actually published. And how did you sort of gravitate towards that community initially? So in college, um, so at that point, I was in Toronto, actually, at York University. Um, I was the arts editor for the community newspaper Excalibur, and also um, I ran a radio show at CHRY. Uh, Through that, I met a bunch of people who were playing um, Dungeons and Dragons. And um, I worked alongside a gentleman who was working for Random House of Canada. And he had been handed the um, TSR account. And at that time, there was no role-playing magazine. Um, Like there was no version of Dragon that was Canada-based, Canadian. Um, And I got, because I was getting, um, he, the gentleman who was um, working for Random House um, had all this promotional material and they were throwing it out every month. So um, instead of throwing it out, he would give me a box of it. And I mean, there'd be like a thousand dollars worth of product. Um, So I felt, you know, obligated to actually do something with it. So I started reviewing it and he would send the reviews to New York, but I wasn't reviewing it for a publication because there wasn't one. So it gave me the idea, well, why don't I start a magazine? Um, So I came up with the idea of Cryptic Magazine 
Oh, okay. So I came up with the idea for that and I wandered around Toronto to game stores and talked to people and realized very quickly that one of the reasons that there wasn't a Canadian gaming magazine was there wasn't enough distribution in Canada to make it worthwhile. So I realized that I would have to get US distributors if I was going to put out a magazine. Um, and so I put together, I found a convention for gaming um, called the um, Gamma Trade Show. And I put together a press kit very quickly. A few late nights by the sounds of it. It, it, was, it was very fast. I had to throw together something that looked like an, a magazine without actually having a magazine. Got to respect that hustle. Sell. So hopped on a plane with my father, who was helping me at that time. Um, and we went to Vegas. Yeah. And I started shopping around to distributors. Mm -hmm. So I remember very clearly one distributor saying like, you know, kind of get lost. Uh, we've seen magazines come and go in this industry. You're going nowhere. Just don't even bother. You might as well just pack it in right now. Um, but I didn't give up. And I ended up getting um, Diamond Distribution, which was a huge distributor um, to agree to carry it, right? But you know, like still, I needed a lot of magazines to be sold if I was gonna make it worth my while. So um, at that time, there were a bunch of Canadian game designers and we were hanging out in the bar mm -hmm. and I got introduced to Peter Atkinson. I knew that name. <laughs> Peter Atkinson at that time was, um, he was at the head of, you know, he's head of the Wizard of Wizards of the Coast, and um, they were in a lawsuit, um, and it was a big lawsuit, and it was crushing them. And basically, they were not going to be able to put out any product until this lawsuit was settled. The problem was in this industry, if you didn't put out regular product, you kind of just kept going down on the list at the distributors, and and yeah, you got lost. Um, so it was interesting to them that I was putting out a, a publication that would come out regularly. So he pitched to me the idea, well, how about we distribute your magazine to our international distribution base? Okay, wizards themselves would. Mm -hmm. And so we would, they would put their product code on my magazine, but I would retain entirely editorial control. So it would literally just be a distribution deal. And the agreement between us was, you know, if it's not going well, just let us know and we'll part ways. Total, amicably, no problem. Um, so I was like, I didn't see a downside to this. Um, it helped them out. It helped me out. It looked like a great win-win situation. Yeah. So I'm working now on a magazine, which is going to come out in July of 93. And that is one of Cryptic. Um, around, I'm gonna say April or May. Yep. Peter was looking for investors for a new product that they had set up a new game company called Garfield Games. And they had this new game and he was hoping people would invest in it. Um, and I said, I'd take a look. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I, you know, looked at Magic the Gathering, which was, um, it was Mana Flash actually at that time. And we got wow. little tiny play test cards. They were like cardboard. So you, you saw it before it was finished. You saw these, these play test cards and got the game demonstrated. And the thing was, I had this connection with Peter and this new company that he was setting up wasn't Peter's company. It was really Richard Garfield's company, right? That was the so I didn't really feel like I wanted to invest in this other company. I was in the theater. <laughs> right. You know, none of the people who worked for Wizards of the Coast at the time that Mana Flash was being discussed actually worked for Wizards of the Coast full time. They all had full time jobs. Um, Peter was working for Boeing, for instance. So Wizards of the Coast was the project that they did after hours and on the weekends. So this new product that they were putting out, you know, they were doing double time. Um, and, you know, fast forward a little bit, um, you know, they were at the point where they, they needed to show the product because they were, they had enough investors. They had, had committed that they were going to put out this product. So they started commissioning art. 
Jesper was like deep in the trenches putting together, you know, the card, the card itself, right? That's Jesper Miracle. It's the original art director for Magic. Yeah, he's an amazing guy. Um, you know, they were all working 24 seven. I mean, any extra time they had outside their regular work, I mean, they were sleeping on the floor at the office and there was very little sleep I think period which the office at the time was Peter's basement right <laughs> anyway he you know they they killed themselves <laughs> to put magic at um so meanwhile I'm you know industrially industriously um putting out a magazine so I'm putting it yep cryptic number one and the cool thing about cryptic number one is that it was going to have the wizards of the coast newsletter in it um at this point no one knows that magic, no one really knows anything about magic. Or trading card games in general. Right, like collectible card games don't exist yet. So I'm putting out this role-playing game magazine and my I'm launching it in um, at the Fort Worth Convention um, Origins in July. And that's where I'm going to show the magazine. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited about it and excited about hanging out with, with Wizards of the Coast and Peter. Mm -hmm. They scraped together enough money to get there, which was a huge problem because they had no capital at this point. Um, Wizards of the Coast was totally broke. The only money that anyone had was Garfield Games. So they were on a shoestring to get places. Wow. Fast forward, I got the magazine to the printer and that was a process for me. Um, back in those days, I mean, I had no desktop publishing skills. So I was learning as I was going. Yeah, so it sounds like a real trial by fire. You're basically putting everything together. It almost, I love the parallels of the story. Like Wizards is cobbling together this thing. Meanwhile, you're cobbling together Cryptic, which is the magazine that was the very first magazine to reference magic ever. Yes. All of a sudden, so what makes you decide to pivot from Cryptic, which was an RPG magazine, uh, and move away from that into something like Scry? So a, that was a year later. So let me fast forward though, because Gen Con is important. And I think that, right, because to the CCG industry, Gen Con is where magic began. But actually, magic began at Origins because the very first long boxes came off the plane from Belgium and they didn't have decks. So the, um, the staff, um, Peter, uh, Jasper, Richard, I guess, was there. I don't remember playing with Richard. He would have been really busy if he was there. Um, they made decks out of these long boxes, but they didn't have enough cards because like it was whatever you got in a full set. So you had like a limited amount of land. Um, so we had kind of playable decks that we were playing with in the bar and they were showing the retailers how to play. So they were getting pre-orders there. Fast forward a month, we hit Gen Con. At Gen Con, I'm exhibiting at the Wizard of the Coast booth. So I have my first issue in my magazine. I'm so excited. Meanwhile, they've got booster packs saying, try this new game. Right, and the retailers are like already insane. The players are insane. There are, you know, three, four people deep at the Wizards of the Coast booth. You couldn't see me at all. I was like on the corner of the booth. I mean, like, you know, they're like, if you don't have magic, we're not interested kind of thing, right? Although we did sell a lot of magazines, but you know, like nowhere near, you know, what the kind of craziness was for magic. It was so cool. People were like ripping open booster packs and putting together decks and like sitting on the floor um, around Gen Con and just like playing. And it was such a cool experience to like see all these people like hanging out, playing magic for the first time. Um, the buzz was huge. I mean, they were totally, totally sold out like they were sold out like the reprint run by the time gen con was done and they were like holy shit what are we gonna do well you can just see the the people are uh, becoming obsessed with it in the moment what other game product had done that to that date or ever since really no not at the same kind of you know absolute craziness it was it was insane frenzy it was also insane a month later when i'm trying to get out my second issue and talk to Wizards of the Coast because they have no, like they're just basically hiring at this point people off the street. <laughs> I, I mean, like they needed warm bodies to like handle things. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I'm a product that has to be put out and shipped and I you know, need to talk to them. Getting the second newsletter was really fun because like that was something extra they had to do, but I needed to have it. 
Um, so we kind of ways, we got the second issue out, we got the third issue out. I think around December, I let them know this was not working. Well, their priorities had shifted so much since you made this deal, right? Right, like we couldn't talk to them, we couldn't interact with them. So we decided that in the winter of 94, that was it 94? Yeah, 94, we would just take back distribution. I mean, we already had all the distributors, they were all dealing with us directly anyways, because that's how it had to work because Wizards of the Coast just couldn't handle everything that was going on. I was gonna say in that same winter, they start publishing Duelist, right? Yeah, that's probably right. So then they, right, Shadus was also publishing all the information they could get at that time on Magic. So there was the three of us, it was the Duelist, Shadus and, um, and Cryptic. So fast forward to March, 94. We're at the Gamma Trade Show again. We're in the bar. This time we're in New Orleans, which is a cooler venue. Um, it's three o'clock in the morning again. Peter is sitting down with um, John Zinzer, um, who published Shadis and also is the founder of um, uh, AEG, does Legend of Five Rings. So anybody who wants to hear about John, go back and listen to episode one and five. John's on those ones. Great guy. Oh, absolutely. Real entrepreneur. Um, um, you know, basically a lot of things wouldn't have existed without him and without Ryan too. Legend of the Five Rings and all of AG games, Dune Town. Right, we were mortal enemies at that time. <laughs> what, you and John and Ryan? Not Ryan. Ryan wasn't really in the picture at that point, but John and I were mortal enemies because we had, we had competitive magazines. Oh, right, of course. Because John hadn't moved into games yet. No. Him and Jolly were still making shaders. Um, I can't remember when Legend of the Five Rings. Oh, not until late five, not 95, late 95 that was. Anyway, so we're sitting, John... Peter and I are sitting in this bar at 3 a.m. in the hotel. And Peter's like, so one of you two needs to put out a magazine that's a price guide for these cards because we can't do it. So Peter suggested the valuation price guide idea. He's like, you know, the, the, the stores need a price guide and you two are the only ones that can do it. So you guys figure it out. You, one of you needs to do it. Yeah, well, just remind everybody listening, obviously there was no websites, there was no eBay or sold listings or anything like that that you could track. Everybody needed, if, if cards were going to be sold singly, people needed some sort of way to mediumize that. All right, well, this was a really interesting industry to be in because it worked differently than many other industries that were similar. It didn't work like the baseball car industry in the same way. The people who owned um, comic shops and game shops you know there's a lot of blend between the two we're like mom and pop shops and they really had a relationship with their customers not to say that baseball card sellers didn't but really specifically the comic game stores really felt like they didn't want to rip off their customers in any way yeah the games industry was such a family or you know community-based thing you know, people would come and play in the stores to games and stuff like that. You know, often the store owners were the dungeon masters for some of the customers, you know what I mean? Right. They wanted a long relationship with their customers and, you know, ripping them off was not a way to make a relationship. So pricing cards was really hard for them. And they didn't have any way of telling how much a card was really worth because there was all this information wandering around like, oh, Black Lotus sold for this and you know, Moxes are this much, but what's a really fair price? And they didn't really want to put a price on a card and then have a kid walk into the store with, you know, crying with their parents in tow, going, you ripped me off, you know, ripped off my kid. So that opens the door for somebody has to do a magazine that is going to be a price guide that actually takes into account that. So tell me just for my own personal interest, what was John's reaction to this suggestion, if you remember? I do. Um, I, it'd be interesting, you know, I don't know if he remembers. I'll ask him in our third episode. He didn't have the money to put out a magazine that would have that kind of print run at that time because it was going to be expensive. I mean, you can imagine like the interest in a magazine. They didn't have the resources, they didn't have the money. So that meant it was me or- Yeah, opportunity knock. So, you know, what an entrepreneur is to do, right? Things were moving so fast then. Okay, so I got back to the hotel room. I told, 
you know, I told my parents, oh my God, we're going to put a magazine out in a month and a half. And we drove to New Orleans because at that time we were in Florida and that's where we were based. And so we got home and I was like, I have no idea how to do this. I mean, you know, we've been through a ton of stuff already learning how to do cryptic, but you know, Scry was a whole nother world. Well, what people have to remember is there was no, like we said, there's no internet. There was no way to communicate what that fair price was. Like, how did you come up with these lists? Like what, what effort was put into that? Like, what was the situation there? So that was exactly the problem, like how to do that. Yeah. So Peter didn't provide that information. He said, make the lists, but he didn't tell you how to do it. Oh, no, no, like not, not even like, it's just put a price guide out. No, there was no instruction beyond like, one of you has to do this and we can't. So somebody else has to do it. It should be one of you to figure it out. Wow. So the way that we decided to do the prices was to have a true median and then quartiles. So the mom and pop shops would feel comfortable with having a range of prices that they could choose from. Um, that gave a good representation of what was selling out there and not allowing gamifying. Um, you know, some of the stores would give us like crazy high prices, but crazy high prices would just drop off the top. They'd be outliers, yeah. So this gave a good center section and made people feel comfortable. Yes, we can price the cards and not rip people off. Um, and we tried to choose stores that would be honest, you know, not try to gamify. Right. We had a relationship with the stores too. I mean, you know, we talked to them. Um, they were friends. Well, it's so interesting you say that you, you know, you were friends with the stores because much like you did with the publishers with Cryptic, you gave the stores a bit of a voice back then. You know, you had that four corners column in these early magazines of Scry where the stores could tell basically on the ground stories about what collectible card games were doing. Right. We wanted to bring them in and make them feel part of what we were doing because it was important to represent them in the best way so that they could feel comfortable, you know, with selling the cards um, and selling us and building relationships with their customers the way we were building relationship with them as a customer, you know, because they're selling our magazine too. So they want to feel comfortable with us and they want to feel comfortable handing it to their their customers and using it to price their cards. Wow. Okay. Um, but again, that was, you know, it was a big industry and there was a lot of, you know, manipulation of prices. Uh, that's so fascinating because at the moment there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of speculation on old cards. There's a lot of speculation in the market at the moment, um, you know, coming back from, you know, the, the effects of the last couple of years and stuff like that. So it's so interesting to hear that these parallels existed on a much smaller scale all those years ago, back at the very genesis of, of, you know, uh, what Magic the Gathering and, and other collectible card games are doing at the time. I mean, you know, this, this grew out of a mom and pop game industry. You know, they were comic shops too, but it, it's a different, it's a different industry and it has that very personal connection. And I yes. know, my mother would have called it folksy at that point, which would make me, you know, cringe. <laughs> I mean, we're talking to the game companies the same way we would talk to the retail stores. You know, it wasn't about selling magazines or selling ads or whatever it was having a connection with the company knowing what their product was knowing what was coming out next to that point i i mean the games industry at that stage yes they'd had a huge success with dungeons and dragons and stuff like that but most of it was you know fan driven it was like where we love um, you know rpgs and stuff like that before magic we're gonna put this out much like peter was you know he was a fan much before he was a rpg publisher and that connection ties to the stores it ties to the whole community so i guess that sort of leads to my question because you were there and you sort of witnessed the change what if you could sort of take a you know like a bird's eye view of the 93 to 96 sort of 95 maybe era like what how did you see the industry change from that mom and pop store with the money and the attention that something like magic the gathering and collectible card games injected into the industry coming out the other side like what what was the biggest changes you saw there i mean when money is being changed when is it, money is changing hands at the rate that it was changing for magic you have a lot of people coming to an industry that weren't in it before who are interested in making more of it um, 
So you have an industry that's rapidly changing by the amount of product being produced for market and the number of people trying to get an edge on selling it. And that was fun to navigate too, because, you know, distribution was changing. Mail order companies were popping up competing with retail stores. Mm -hmm. We began to get a competitor. We had um, another price guide, two two of them. Inquest was the significant one. I'm, you know, I... I'm not going to speak badly of anyone, but they did things very differently than we did because their end game was very different than ours. We were looking at, you know, having a relationship with these stores long term. Scry does read, and I mean this in the most positive way possible, very folksy by comparison to Inquest. Like it is, it is a, a, you know, like you said, a, basically an on the ground view, whereas Inquest has all this irreverent humor and feels like it's a little bit overproduced, whereas Scry did feel very almost handmade, community driven, almost grassroots, if you will. Well, also we were having, you know, we framed the magazine so that it would be family oriented as opposed to that irreverent, you know, humor that um, Inquest liked to drive to make things edgy. That really wasn't our take on the industry. Um, when you're, you know, there's more to than, there's more to media than just, you know, getting a reaction and selling copies. Um, you know, maybe you can argue there isn't because the whole goal is to sell magazines, but as I say, this industry worked differently. So we came from it, from the gaming part, sort of evolving to this. We didn't sort of, you know, jump in in the middle of the fur of magic and, hey, how can we make money? Um, we weren't really in this for the money either, because in the beginning, there wasn't a huge amount of money in this. Yeah. Building relationships and going for that long haul meant that we also had to have a product I felt that uh, the stores that were dealing with families could sell and be comfortable selling. Yeah, well, I mean, I completely agree. Like, obviously, like you said, you guys had come and brought that feeling of that sort of handmade, hand stitched, mom and pop sort of family first magazine into the industry, and it had followed this wave. And then, obviously, things like Moses Publications Inquest drops in and is, you know edgy like you said and 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 in your face and and it did just evolve from this other thing um which i mean both of them have their place and both of them have their fans but at the same time i do appreciate the community that scry code and built like i put that in the intro uh, about this magazine or, or magazines in general building a community around them and that seemed like something that was very important to scry and i say that because i mean things like you put a picture or a little like, you know, a little thumbnail picture of who was writing the article to build that community, to build that relationship with the players and sort of unite people around this community. Yeah, in those days, like you didn't have pro players yet in the very early days, but you had people who were really avid players and fans. And we tried to pull them in and have them actually writing so that you didn't have like people who were, you know, famous writing, but you had like, people who are actually in the trenches playing with the new decks or the new cards, um, just like you were. Well, I mean, the one thing I want to point out there is, is previous guest on the show in one of the early episodes, Mike Fitzgerald used to write for you guys. And he just loves card games. Like and he designed a bunch, but he was writing about other games that he had nothing, you know, to do with as far as design goes. He was just writing as a fan, you know, somebody who loved that sort of game. It was always a pleasure to, to interact with. Um, yeah, I miss I miss talking to him because he he's a great conversationalist as well, um, really really down to earth guy too, and a great speaker because he's a radio radio host, previous radio host. He was a great podcast guest. Yeah, exactly. Like Mike, he was a great guy and and really gave an an honest sort of genuine approach to uh, whatever game he was working on, and which was Wyvern, of course. Yeah, but I mean, his articles would be about BattleTech and stuff that he had no stake in whatsoever, just as a fan. Because he. He played lots of games because that's what a game designer does. They play lots of games. Absolutely. Um, that's, that's absolutely amazing. Um, I do want to pivot for a second because obviously, you know, you have just described, um, unbeknownst to me, a, a long-lasting relationship with Wizards of the Coast. I mean, Scry Magazine seems to be the brainchild of Peter Atkinson now, uh, or at least, you know, the price guide yeah. element of it. Um, 
just to walk that back. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, what, <laughs> <laughs> um, what was what was your relationship with Wizards after Scry started coming out? After the first few years, How, did that change at all? Did you feel like there was a difference there? Like once they started to not go corporate, but as as they started to grow and incorporate more people, you know, I always had a really I felt like I had a really great relationship with the people I interacted with at Wizards. But, you know, other than, you know, we were dealing with different levels at Wizards, you know, at the point where we're trying to get information, that was a different department now. And there was a whole new staff and the staff was changing constantly. And so, I mean, they were growing and changing and evolving and it was challenging to, deal with the company because things were changing so fast for them. Um, I always felt that, you know, there was something that I needed a quick answer to that was really important. I had no problem, you know, reaching out to one of the original founders and saying, hey, so help. But we didn't have to do that. I mean, you know, I could probably count it on two hands over the years the number of times that we needed to do that. So we weren't interacting with them on a regular basis, but you know, always it was always like a friendly relationship. However, as a company, because they were growing and the industry was changing, you, we had competitors. So they had to treat us like everybody else, which I understand they had their own in-house magazine. So they were covering the game stuff and they had to give them the edge on whatever the cool new thing was. Um, and they couldn't really deal with us differently than Shadus or Inquest. No favoritism. You know, having a relationship with the people doesn't mean you have a relationship with the company in a different way. Yeah, it must be so interesting to sort of navigate that. So that leads me to an interesting question. Like you had this unique sort of almost, you know, passenger seat to the whole rise and fall of that first sort of period of like from Magic to Jihad to Star Trek to like all of those games ramping up and then uh, to about mid 95 and then everybody like you said trying to cash in and then all of a sudden booms are always followed by crashes like that's just that's just business 101 do you have any perspective on 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 that arc like uh, how how you saw that happen we had some little crashes in between i mean wizards of the coast messed up um, and i mean understandably with fallen empires of course printing to demand right I don't know, this is my weird perspective on it, but I have to share it because it's- Please do. Every expansion that came out in that first year, I thought was really fun. The name that they gave it, because you had Arabian Nights where things were like swirling around in this like fantasy world that was just crazy. And then you had Antiquities where things were like solid and almost like hard to move because they were at the point where the company was like, it had grown so big and it wasn't really sure how to get to the next level. Um, and then you have uh, what Legends was next, right? Yeah, where they're like, they're starting to like get enough people now that they're like, they've grown and they're, they're putting out roots. It's sort of, they're becoming legendary themselves, yep. They're going forward. They're, they're moving forward as warriors, right? And then you have, do you have Fallen Empires next? The Dark. You have the Dark period where like, they weren't really sure what the next thing was. They were going towards the dark, right? And then you have fallen empires. From, from that, it's like they went into the dark and they went with sort of blind faith into the dark that it would all work out. And then they had fallen empires. And it just- No one could have predicted it because no one saw it coming in the way that it happened. The distributors all ordered, they took on more distributors who weren't really distributors. People just trying to get cheap product. I mean, three, four times the amount of product that they could even imagine possibly selling because they assumed it would sell. Mm -hmm. And they got, because their future version of the world was if we order a lot, our next allocation will be bigger. Because obviously there's only so much product. Allocation is when there's only so much product to go around and your order gets scaled to how much you order. So people were ordering way more than they were. Right. And it was happening in the whole three tier system. Like it was happening at a customer level as well. Like customers would go to four stores to pre-order products and put in phantom orders just to hope that they got one box from each store. But when Fallen Empires came along and they originally cautioned people that they would printed to order, which they did, 
that resulted in a crash and six waves of product just tanked, like just tanked many hobby stores because they invested so much into it, more than they ever expected to get. Plus it wasn't a great set. If it had been a different set, it might've had a different outcome, but it was small and it didn't do what people wanted out of a set. So it was a disaster on all levels. Yeah, I was going to say, it's so funny because it's it's seen internally by, you know, Richard Garfield and the original creators of Magic as the favorite set that they made because it was so complex. But obviously the market rejected that sort of style, you know, like they wanted the big numbers and the and the mana, you know, whatever they call mana ramp or mana manipulation stuff. Right. It wasn't the time for that set. I think it was poorly timed. But, you know, in retrospect, you can look at these things and go, oh, yeah, we should have done. But no. Well, like you said, aptly named Fallen Empires at the time. I mean, and that was that was a, you know, main slide. Um, and then they pulled back and like reassessed where they were. And we they didn't recover for a little while. Mm. This was not Ice Age next. Yeah, Ice Age was mid 95. At that point, they really you know, had to figure out how to play the game. Um, I mean, they were playing and they were doing a great job, but Fallen Empires, they had, they had kind of like pushed back and said, all right, you guys want it, we're gonna give it to you. And, and it was a disaster on both levels. I mean, both, both for the company and for the, for the industry. But, you know, they recovered and that was Ice Age. And, and then we, we went up again, which was great. Um, and more games came out. Absolutely. And more games came out. So here's an interesting question. Did you see that the rest of the market followed Magic? Or do you think that when Magic went down, did that cause an uptick for other products in the in the space at the time? Oh, because there was such a crash of money was one of the problems. I mean, you know, like everybody had thrown their money into Fallen Empires, um, hoping that they were going to get, you know, product and make a lot of money out of it. And instead, they had warehouses of product that they couldn't sell. So they had their money sitting in fallen empires because this industry works differently than other industries. When you sell a product in this industry, you sell it. Mm -hmm. It's not going back. Yeah. There are no returns in the real world. If you sell um, like a magazine to Barnes and Noble or borders or a bookstore and they don't sell them all, they can return them. So you don't get paid for them unless they actually sell. That doesn't happen in this market. Well, it's so interesting you bring that up. Obviously, you know, the most famous example of that for game-oriented audiences or tabletop game-oriented audiences is TSR and, and they're selling to the book channel uh, Dungeons & Dragons and eventually getting a return and crashing themselves. Returns absolutely kill you because six months later, you find out how much you sold. Yeah, and you spent the money from the sales before. Yeah, there's there's... A, there's a whole learning curve to how magazines work and books work, um, which I got to be at the front lines of. <laughs> so 95 was a huge heyday for us and as well coming full circle to your question earlier, the industry, because there were so many games coming out. We were trying to cover as many as we could. We were also trying to get the absolute last minute information on every game that came out. We ran the magazine like a newspaper. So at the, literally the day that the magazine was going to print, we were still making changes. Wow. So anything that dropped the day that we went to press was in. So uh, that's the boom. Like, obviously there's this, there's this absolute influx into the industry. Obviously it's putting weight on your magazine. At some point you have to pick and choose. There's probably new companies that are reaching out to you to hey, can we get this advertising or can you write an article about this as well that, that probably didn't even end up making it to market? They wanted to be on the cover. And then we were also doing card inserts as well, which we had- Yep, promo cards, yep. Like all these things to learn. I, I, I mean, we hadn't dealt- at, at one point we were printing with the, the biggest publishers, the biggest printers in America, the ones that do like the, at that time, the yellow pages. We right. went from a wow. tiny- tiny little printer in rockford illinois for cryptic to the largest printer in the united states well i mean and look how does that speak to the market as well right like you know like you said just overnight you basically went from fifty thousand issues to one hundred and fifty thousand issues plus i think we did 165 was the biggest print run we ever did and getting that up to date and updating that at the minute of press time like a newspaper as you said that's absolutely unbelievable because if you missed your print deadline with one of these big printers, they said, 
too bad. Yeah, we'll, we'll get you in when we have time, right? And that could have been a week later, could have been two weeks, you know, it just depends on, they've scheduled things very, very tightly. So um, I guess my question is, so you're in mid-1995, everything is booming and demand is at the highest point you could probably imagine. You know, there's, there's literally dozens of new games um, and you're coming into a point now where you obviously, as somebody who has been in this industry at this point for, you know, four or five years, you probably know what the industry is capable of and you probably know that all these new games probably can't survive at any given point. So at some point, mid-1995, is actually in one of these magazines, you, you, you say that your feelings about the future of collectible card games is both bleak and optimistic. How did you feel going into that, you know, mid-1995 and coming into 1996 where things started to, you know, take a downward turn? I don't think we ever looked at it as a downward turn. I mean, the, the thing that happened was Pokemon. So you had kind of like a deluge of, all these games, but we were reporting on them. So for us, it wasn't a question of whether the game sold well, it was only we were giving information out on whatever the new game was. So for us, I think the industry was just as strong in 95 and 96. Um, 97, when Pokemon came out, what, 90? Early 99. You know, things then maybe were soft, but Pokemon was, I mean, people were crazy for it. Right. Well, tell me about that. Like, how did that change what you were doing? Like, obviously you guys, you guys go from, you know, reporting on games like Xena and Hercules that are, you know, a little bit of fanfare, Magic's been always doing what it is. And all of a sudden this juggernaut from Japan through your friends, you know, or the people that you knew at Wizards of the Coast is getting distributed and it changes everything. All of a sudden collectible card games go from a product that was for university students to being the must have kids toy of Christmas, 1999. Like, how does that affect you guys? Well, um, in the beginning it was, okay, so how do we deal with this? How do, how do we get the edge on it? Because we're at that point we're running a magazine that is supposed to support the industry and help the industry. Um, and then further, you know, uh, fans love for whatever the product is coming. So we couldn't get too much out of Wizards of the Coast because at that point, they're a huge company and you're dealing with only the people that are kind of at the front lines that- Public relations, yeah. The only thing we could think of to get an edge was, okay, so what if we got the Japanese cards and we translated them before the set arrived? And my husband um, had a friend in San Francisco, whose wife is Japanese and he's a translator. And so we organized getting the cards shipped from Japan to him. Like physical cards, like a, a, the whole set of every single physical yeah. card. And he and his wife sat down and translated the text on every single card and we printed it in the magazine. That's amazing. It worked, you know, it was like, that was a huge selling feature and a way of getting information to the fans before the set came out that I wasn't going to be able to get from Wizards of the Coast. You, you, all of a sudden, it's so interesting that you went from, you know, we said earlier that Wizards would, would give you a little bit of information and then rebuff you as they got bigger and everything like that to all of a sudden upstreaming them and taking the power back from that, like in, in, in being able to just take something publicly from Japan and translate it and give it to the people. It's so fascinating. Well, I mean, the product was out. I mean, it was, it was we public. weren't doing anything except giving information that was already there. So we weren't breaking copyright. You know, it was like, these are the cards. We're not making money off the cards. We're just telling the fans what might be coming in this new set. Yeah, absolutely. So that was our huge edge. And, and that we did really, really well with that. Um, and 99 in the fall, I was getting, I was so tired. Every issue was this complete craziness. Like between balancing translations and new card listings. And I have to assume the price guide is going crazy as Pokemon evolves, no pun intended. Yes. I mean, so we kept having to expand the price guide to represent all these games that had come out. Um, but if there wasn't enough data because single cards weren't worth anything, there was no point in listing the cards individually. You would just list the sets or the booster box, the booster packs, if there was a secondary market for them. But keeping all that running, 
you know, obviously the stores were reporting electronically at that point. So that was helpful to me. I didn't have to do the, as much data entry. Right. Okay. The po when Pokemon came out and we had to do the translations, that was a whole nother aspect of editorial that had to be done and then layout as well. Um, I was tired. Wow. Did you, did you see a different sort of market come to you then going, oh my God, it's, it's, it's Pokemon. Like, you know, you were doing, you were in Barnes and Noble, you were in Walden Books, you were in hobby game stores. Were other elements of the market reaching out to you? Was there toy stores reaching out or anything like that? So yeah, we were popping up in all kinds of places which was good for the print run and for advertising. But as I say, the actual day-to-day -day work that needed to be done had expanded. And so um, we'd been approached, um, I think about a year before by Krause Publications. Right, yep. But by Pokemon, I was like, oh my, I, I don't know if I can keep doing this forever. Yeah, so you're feeling the weight of Pokemon coming in now, like this giant multinational, international brand that is all of a sudden, you know, requiring all of your time that's bigger than Magic ever was. You know, you know, Wizards of the Coast, I mean, famously said that they expected $4 million from Pokemon in its first year, and it did $400 million. So that time, you know, that 100x multiplier is just something that blew everybody away at the time. Um, so essentially, you're leading into deciding whether you want to sell to you know an actual publisher who handles this stuff every single day um i don't in the normal boost pack episodes i reach out to the community and ask um questions if there's anybody who wants to but in this case i did only reach out to one in particular person and and that's where he comes into this story because i reached out to john jackson miller yeah yeah so i took he took over from you as the editor of scry once uh Krause took over the um publication of scry um and he said that you guys work with them and obviously transition the magazine and stuff like that. What stories do you have from that time? You know, he wants to see what you remember and, and, and I would too. Well, okay, so that was the fall of 99 and we reached out to Krause again and we said, okay, so we're interested in discussing the possibility of a sale. Um, and they were like, yes, we are here for this. Um, at that point, uh, Wizards of the Coast was also being purchased by uh hasbro yep 99 and i had to decide if this is what i wanted to do um pokemon changed things a lot as you say 400 million dollars there's a lot of money in this industry and it's now a toy industry yeah uh, i was in the games industry uh, i was doing a, i learned a lot about publishing and i loved all of that learning but i was kind of at that peak where we had we learned all that so I wanted to do the next thing, whatever that was. So we talked to them and they said, yes. And so we cut a deal. And uh, I think the last issue was November. It's my recollection. Yes. I think John said that you guys got the, he got the December issue out under extreme circumstances, you know, complete crunch. Well, because they were taking over it, in a way it was easy. And in another way it was hard because they were a company that ran lots of magazines so they had their system down of as to how they did things and we had ours and they weren't the same well john tells a fun story that like he had to send away for somebody to scan a card into his magazine whereas you could just scan it on your own personal scanner it was a completely different system exactly and and that was one of the challenges for Krause because they hadn't really done this type of publication it was like mm -hmm. everything was hard for John um, and um, trying to think who worked with him. Um, Joyce? Joyce, yes. And so there was constant contact. And I actually had a consulting contract with them for years just to support them. But in the end, once it got to them and I gave them like, you know, the rundown of how we did things and how things work, they didn't really need me because they had to figure out how to do what I did in their context. It wasn't that they didn't, they didn't need help after I explained it and gave them all the pieces. They needed help trying to figure out how they were going to make it work at Krause. And that was hard. Um, so all the accolades to them because that was a hard year for them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Especially considering it's at the height of Pokemon. They don't want to lose any traction. Like you said, it's December, the Christmas of Pokemon. So there was a lot of pressure on them to make this work and make it go. Um, I can't even remember how many phone calls we had in the early days. Um, but later, I mean, I, 
I barely heard from them because, you know, they knew what they needed to know. It was just a question of trying to make it work at Krause. Yeah. It's like flying a kite, you know, you guys got them running, but once they're in the air, it was soaring themselves. So, um, my husband at that point where it was still working with them. though, he did the, um, the guide to collectible card games. He worked, um, yeah, with, had all the pictures of the, of the cards. Yeah, yeah, of course. The Scry uh, Collector's Guide and yeah, stuff like Scry's that. Yeah, Collector's Guide, exactly. Um, so that was a project he worked on. And yeah, I mean, it was a it was a long run and I was happy to have a break, I got to tell you, after that. What an amazing six years. You know, you were sort of like this, you know, fly on the wall to this completely new genre in gaming that is 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 the most profitable genre in in physical gaming still today in the world. And and your experiences, you know, dating back to the very first origins, to the first Gen Con, to you know, what you've called a think tank of coming up with the idea for a price guide. It's it's absolutely amazing to hear your story and 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 thread it through this um, amazing para, uh, paradigm of history. I think one thing we didn't cover that is probably really interesting is that mm -hmm. I was one of the very few um, female-owned companies at that time because this industry is extremely male-centric. There are very few women. At a convention, at Gen Con, you know, you see girlfriends, but you didn't see girls that were there on their own in 1993. That was a rarity. So having a woman call them up and try to sell them an ad at a retail store or dealing with a game company and having, you know, JM White was the name I was behind, you know, knowing that it was Joanne on the phone was a big deal. Like at that time, it didn't happen very often that you had a woman game company owner or a woman calling a game company to sell an ad or whatever. I'm so glad you brought this up because I think you're 100% right. You know, Wizards obviously had quite a few women behind it, but many other game companies were not as progressive as that, unfortunately. Um, you brought it up, and I, I guess I'll only ask, but you took uh, the moniker of J.M. White to mask gender in this particularly male-centric industry? Um, I don't know if I did it so much that, but I didn't want to make it that I was a woman to sell anything. Mm -hmm. So I think it made it easier just to have that as a, you know, sort of mystery um, and kind of a surprise too, when, when someone met me and said, oh, you're not a man, right? Um, which was fun. Um, I think I was famous. I always wore a, um, uh, a suit at a convention, which was, you know, not done in those days. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'd be wearing heels and, and a skirt suit. You command power. But I think in those days it was, um, Lisa Stevens, of course, and Jill Lucas at FASA. I can't even name another one. I'm sure there was. I mean, there was Catherine Hines, I guess, was, is it the duelist? Was it sort of in that the was later position though. Watson? When I was there with Cryptic, there was very, there were very few women. As a historian, you know, I, I, you know, had looked back and looked at who was involved. And, you know, like you said, you mentioned Lisa yourself. Like there is so few women even involved. Obviously later people like, Taywin Woodruff come up and and uh... later we have an influx and and it's great and we have a shift in the gaming community which is wonderful where women are playing games and showing up to conventions and not you know taking on game culture because their boyfriend or you know yep. brother or whatever is bringing them in that they're doing it on their own strength that they love games and they want to play games and they're there because they want to be and because those people are doing that they are starting to see that representation of themselves in these games fortunately and and i think that it gave um magic was really great that it was i think they did a pretty good job of like bringing women into gaming through magic that you know it was a it didn't have like a sense of like because it was one on one um, it didn't have the same sense of, oh, you can't be in the, the group, you know, that plays magic. Um, yeah, it wasn't as clicky yeah, as, as exactly. maybe role playing could have been. Right. And, and you had um, women making the choice to play games and buy cards and, you know, it was an in interesting, easy entry into board gaming, card gaming culture um, that had been mostly male centric. Um, but yeah, that was... It was an interesting navigation for a woman being in an industry that was really extremely male centric.
when I yep. arrived um, and then evolved. And now there's lots of companies and lots of women in gaming and it's fabulous. Uh, wait, by comparison, absolutely. But I mean, there's still, there's still work that can be done, I feel like, in that space. And I feel like that there can be better representation as well in, in, in particularly that space as well. And I, I think there are great companies. I think even Wizards right now is doing that sort of stuff and, and being a lot more centric on, uh, or being more um, mindful of, of, of the people that they're hiring and the people that they're putting in these positions and, and exploring that sort of more diverse crowd. And, and gaming at the moment has never been so inclusive. And I'm, I'm so happy, but I do feel like there's a lot of work to go. Yeah, there. I mean, there's always work to be done. But it's great to see that mag like things have become so much more democratic now as well. Like, obviously, the magic community has so many powerful women and stuff like that in it now as a player community and as designers and shepherds for products and everything like that. So I, I couldn't be happier to see that, especially as a historian who looks back and only sees so few many names when in, in the era that we've talked about today. It's so promising that there's been such a break and forward progress. Um, and it's so wonderful to see like the equality. Um, but yeah, there's always work to be done. I think that sort of brings me to the end of the episode. Thank you so much for all your time. Is there anything that we haven't mentioned else that you wanted to touch on before we, we left that you know reminds you of your time in collectible games or the games industry at all? Gosh, I think we've covered so much territory and it's been so much fun talking about um, the early days. Um, you know, I, I probably can come up with like stories that happened at every convention because the convention was the place where all the companies got together. It was all remote, yeah. So lots of business was done at conventions. Yeah, it was a serious time. Ideas were, were made like Scry. You know, this was like business as usual was doing business after our show hours in the bars probably still is done that way. Yep. You blurred the line between business and, and pleasure by the sounds of it. It being up till three in the morning, creating the idea of a price list with, with Peter Atkinson and John's and stuff. Right. And I think it's really interesting that, you know, Peter now owns Gen Con because Gen Con was, you know, is the premier of place for games um, and interacting and not just for the consumers, but also for the companies that went there. Um, but, you know, it's that in exchange of information and being in a place where games are being played and talked about and new things are being dreamed about and new ventures are being created, you know, on the fly. Um, you know, that's what gives the whole gaming industry this, this wonderful creativity and, and fantasy and hopefully in the new millennia, um, you know, we'll have lots of great games that were formulated at at conventions like Gen Con and we'll keep going. I'm sure we will. And with conventions like Gen Con learning from the last 12 to 18 months that, that it doesn't have to just be a physical destination. It can incorporate digital things across the world. You know, these are going to be a completely new era of, of the way that gamers and game companies connect. Yes, totally. Yes. Um, things, things are changing every day. Absolutely. Like none of us saw this last couple of years coming and who knows what we're going to see coming in the future. Hopefully it's a positive. So thank you so much for joining me, Joanne. It has been such a pleasure talking to you. And honestly, I probably could talk to you for another three hours, just about, the, you know, everything from the minutiae of your Mac book to all the interactions you had at Gen Cons and stuff like that. Furthermore, uh, again, I appreciate your time so much. Oh, it's been a pleasure, Rand. Absolutely. So that has been the rare slot, a bonus episode of the Booster Pack. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I have learned so much today. Goodbye from me. Goodbye from you, Joanne. Goodbye. Yes. It's a pleasure being with you. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks so much, guys. See you next time. And there you have it, our episode all about Scry Magazine with its founder, Joanne White. Now, thank you so much, Joanne, for sharing those stories. It was amazing to hear them and there was so much I learned and as for you guys thank you so much for joining me as well now remember if you want to join Joanne on social media she'll be linked in the description below or as for me you can find me as CCG history on either Facebook or Twitter that's twitter.com slash CCG history or at CCG history or facebook.com slash CCG history also, if you'd like to reach out to us, you can either do it through direct messages on either of those. Those are always open, but you can also reach out via email. We now have a new email at theboosterpack at ccghistory.com. Again, you'll find that in the description. So if there is a type of game that you wanted to hear about 
on this channel, or if you wanted to hear about a specific CCG related topic in these rare slot episodes, let us know via either the social media or via the email and we'll do our best to bring you an episode. Now, the last thing is a subscribe on either channel that you've listened to this on would go a long way to bring you even more content. So I would greatly appreciate that if you could do that. Other than that, I have had a great time bringing you this episode and I can't wait to bring you the next episode of the Booster Pack. Until then, thank you so much. And remember, keep shuffling. Love Love Studios production.